As we've been talking about conflicts of identity, I think it's important to engage with this idea of clash of civilizations. Um, and a lot of classes on international politics uh, address clash of civilizations, um, in part because it's out there in the larger um, discourse and conversation. People talk about clash of civilizations, and I think it's worth understanding where that theory comes from, um, how it works, and how social scientists kind of view that theory uh, to kind of have a fuller understanding about the way in which we think about and, and talk about international politics. So Clash of Civilizations is a explanation for how the post-Cold War era is going to operate that was offered by Sam Huntington. It was part of a series of speculative essays that were published in the early 1990s that said sort of what happens now that it, bipolarity and the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, between capitalism and communism is gone. And Sam Huntington said there's all of these sort of rosy arguments floating around about how the, you know, history has ended and things are going to be wonderful and great in the post-Cold War era, and I don't believe it. Huntington says that in the absence of ideological struggles, division doesn't go away in the international system. Um, instead, division becomes grounded in civilizations and that the conflicts of the future are going to be conflicts over these deep cultural differences that exist between people in different parts of the world. And political scientists um, initially sort of nodded along and said, that's provocative, and then began digging into the details and found that there were a lot of, of really um, problematic pieces going on here. Um, like, what is this idea of a civilization, right? And so, um, over the time, people have kind of looked at, at Huntington's attempt to describe this, in which he has this sort of black and white cross-hatched map, um, and sort of his, his qualitative description of, of what he means by civilization. And we've distilled this, this sort of um, map of civilizations um, out of that, um, in which there's sort of Western Christendom, um, which is sort of the red areas, including sort of Australia and New Zealand. Um, there's the Orthodox world, which is Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and on down into uh, through Greece. We have Latin America. Um, there's a handful of sort of odd cases like Haiti and four former British colonies in the Caribbean. Um, you have uh, Islamic civilization or the Muslim world, which spans from North Africa all the way through the Middle East into Central Asia and then down into Southeast Asia. Uh, you have Hindu civilization, basically India and um, uh, Nepal. You have um, Sinic civilization, which is China and Korean Peninsula and into Vietnam. Um, you have Buddhist um, civilizations. You have Japan, which sort of stands alone. And then you have these other countries that also kind of stand alone. So Turkey um, and Israel, uh, Huntington looks at and says, these, these countries are, are sort of oddballs, even within their own region. Um, li likewise, Ethiopia is kind of an oddball, um, although I'm not entirely sure why that is the case. Um, but he flags these different civilizations um, and says that this is going to be the source of, of where we see conflict. And when people look at these civilizations, they, they know that there's a lot of um, oddness in simply painting with these sort of broad brush strokes and saying, you know, India is Hindu civilization, noting that India has, I think, the world's second largest concentration of, of Muslims. There's like 300 million Muslims in India. It's a huge Muslim population, um, and yet it's just sort of broad brush stroke treated as Hindu civilization. Um, likewise, if we're looking at sort of the, the Islamic world that runs from, from North Africa into the Middle East, into Central Asia and Southeast Asia, there's a lot of cultural variation across that huge swath of, of the Eastern Hemisphere, not to mention deep divides between the Sunnis and the Shias and Sufis and uh, Oman, which is sort of an oddball even within sort of the variations within Islam. So internally within civilizations, there's a lot of differences and a lot of divides that again, just kind of get swept away. And if I was trying to maybe make something of a defense for Sam Huntington, I might try in, in two ways. So I had a student, um, who, Native American student who came to me a number of years ago and said, what am I supposed to make of a, of, of a, of a theory like this that says my civilization doesn't exist? And I said, well, yes, <laughs> your civilization, um, indigenous Native American um, communities don't exist in this theory. They're, they're just completely left out. But maybe they're left out because they're subsumed within Western Christendom, which is uh, maybe not the best an answer. Or maybe because the theory is trying to capture uh, 
who controls the machinery of a state. Maybe. Um, I'm not entirely um, sold on that as an explanation because the explanation, as we will talk about when we start talking about how Clash of Civilizations is supposed to work, is not because it's sort of the elite perspective. It's because of something deeper within society. So I, I'm, I'm not 100% sold on that. The other um, explanation I can maybe give is that, yes, we can nitpick this map. Yes, there are things that are left out of, of Huntington's sort of civilizational framework, but theories aren't true. All theories are lies. All theories are false. All theories take an incredibly complex world and simplify it down and say, these are the pieces we need to make need to make sense of the world. And so the, the measure of a theory isn't whether Sam Huntington's map is right. Um, the, the measure of a theory is whether or not thinking about the world in the way that Sam Huntington's map gets us to think about the world is a useful exercise, right? Theories are not true or false. Theories are useful or not useful. And so I, I think the question becomes, is this a useful way to think about how the international system operates? To do that, we need to talk through the story that Sam Huntington tells about how Clash of Civilization operates, right? And so as, if, you, if you dig through his article in his subsequent book, um, he, he begins with this idea of globalization that globalization, technology, and trade is bringing civilizations into greater interaction, that for millennia, the, these um, civilizations grew up more or less in something that looked like isolation or at least minimal contact with the outside world, and now they were suddenly being pushed into this global system in which maybe even there is a common global culture emerging um, with Western Christendom kind of at the center of that. And so a lot of what he talks about is this conflict, this tension between Western Christendom and other um, civilizations. Um, and, and he notes that civilizations uh, do not understand each other. Uh, at just a really fundamental level uh, that there's just different worldviews, different foundational assumptions about pretty much everything, right? The relationship between the individual and the state, or the relationship between men and women, or parents and children, or the individual and the divine, the role and, and purpose of life and, and, and why we exist here on earth. These are questions that different civilizations will answer in fundamentally different ways using stories and symbols that are incredibly important within those civilizations, but are fundamentally misunderstood by other civilizations, <laughs> that they don't recognize the power and the meaning and the deep rootedness of, of a lot of these symbols and stories and ideas and ways of thinking about the world. And so what we have is a world in which we have people who fundamentally think about the world in different ways, who are interacting because of globalization, and those interactions are going to result in culturally grounded misunderstandings. Right? So far, I'm 100% with Sam Huntington, right? Globalization increases interactions. I think that's, that's a solid story. Um, different foundational assumptions about how the world works. I think that's a solid story. I think there's no anthropologist would disagree with that, even if they might pick at the idea of how these civilizations are organized or how um, ancient or immutable they are. Um, and then finally, if you put people in a small room who fundamentally disagree about the world and make them interact, they're going to annoy each other. I think everybody's sort of on board with that, but that's not clash of civilizations. That's just if you put people who, with fundamentally different views about the world in a small room and make them interact, they're going to annoy each other. Clash of civilizations is this next piece. Sam Huntington says that when states find themselves in these miscommunication, cultural annoyance kind of situations, right, these clashings between civilizations are going to galvanize civilizational blocks. Essentially, everybody from Western civilization lines up behind the country that's involved in this conflict, and everybody from the Islamic world lines up behind countries in the other uh, block, and you now have a clashing not of two leaders who have annoyed each other, or two countries that have you know misunderstood each other, but a clash of civilizational blocks. That's clash of civilizations. And there's not actually a lot of evidence that this happens. And, and I'll maybe give you a, a couple ways of thinking about this. One, I'll just summarize that political scientists have been crunching the numbers on clash of civilizations for decades, and the evidence is not there. Um, what we find is that states are just as likely statistically controlling for things like geography, controlling for things like political systems, controlling for things like trade. Um, they're just as likely 
to fight countries who are within their civilization, as defined by Sam Huntington, as between civilizations. Um, again, as defined by Sam Huntington. So we're not really seeing that, that civilization is an important part of the story, at least in terms of where countries end up getting into war. But we might make the case that maybe there, this clashing can be seen in, in other situations. And so I'll maybe um, talk a little bit about the global war on terror. This is something that I think a lot of people would maybe point to and say, this is clash of civilizations in a nutshell. You have the West, you have um, Islam, they're clashing, they're fighting. It's a decades long conflict. Yes and no. So certainly if you were to ask Al-Qaeda and, and Osama bin Laden why the attack uh, on 9-11 was launched, they would talk about religion as an important part of that story. But it was also a story that was framed around sort of policy issues about support for uh, oppressive regimes in the Middle East by the United States and how um, the United States had troops stationed in Saudi Arabia after the, the Persian Gulf War in the early 1990s. So there were, there were specific policy concerns that were embedded in that. It wasn't just simply um, religion, but also when you look at sort of how things played out afterwards, um, after 9-11, certainly after 9-11, NATO invoked Article 5 of the NATO alliance and said the United States has been attacked and we're going to rally to the United States. And you get essentially all the countries in Western Christendom lining up behind the United States and supporting the United States in the invasion of Afghanistan to oust um, the Taliban and hunt down and destroy uh, Al-Qaeda. So that looks a lot like clash of civilizations and that you get that galvanizing effect in the West, but you don't see a galvanizing effect within the Islamic world. Um, not a single country comes to the aid of the Taliban or to um, Al-Qaeda. Um, there's no rallying to protect them. In fact, there's the exact opposite. You get multiple Muslim countries assisting and facilitating in the invasion of Afghanistan, assisting and facilitating US efforts to hunt down Al-Qaeda globally. Um, in fact, in Tehran, you get a million people marching in the streets for the United States after September 11th. There's no, there's no galvanizing that's occurring within the, uh, the Muslim world against the United States um, after September 11th. A couple years later, the United States pushes to invade Iraq um, there's no clash of civilizations in this case. In fact, it fractures the Western Alliance bloc. Um, the two countries that are most uh, vehemently opposed to the US invasion of Iraq are France and Germany, and they work very hard diplomatically to try to prevent the United States from engaging um, with an invasion of Iraq and, and to block them at the United Nations Security Council. So we're not seeing that galvanization um, in the U.S. invasion of Iraq, but we're also not seeing the galvanization in the Islamic world. Again, nobody really comes to the aid of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Um, the closest we can say is that Turkey, which is part of that NATO alliance and is, is a, a U.S. security partner, um, tells the United States that it doesn't want the United States to use Turkish territory to launch the invasion. Um, on the other hand, Kuwait um, says, you can use our territory. They're to the north, get them there's a split within the Islamic world as well. And so we're just, we're not seeing that galvanization piece. Another place where we can maybe look at this is, is thinking about civil wars. And I wanna flag um, what goes on in um, Sudan because one of the predictions of Huntington's classroom of civilizations thesis is that we should see conflicts occurring at what he calls the shatter zone, where two civilizations meet or where two, uh, two civilizations cut across the borders of a country. And so if you're looking at Sudan, which is sort of um, to the left of, of Ethiopia in, in the Horn of Africa, um, you see, right, cutting right through the center of Sudan um, is this divide between the Muslim world and this sort of sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, population. And sure enough, there's a decades long civil war uh, right along that fault line between um, the government in Khartoum, which is um, a, an Islamist um, government versus the South, which is sort of a black African animist Christian um, population. They fight and eventually gain independence and Sudan is torn into and becomes Sudan and South Sudan. But almost as soon as that fight is done, a second uh, civil war breaks out within Sudan that's East versus West. Um, which is between um, the 
more Arab Muslim population uh, and, and leadership based in Khartoum versus um, the folks in Darfur who are Muslim, um, but tend to be more black African um, who resist and try to gain independence from Khartoum. Um, so it's not actually a conflict at all about, about religion. Um, it's not a conflict at all about civilization. It's a conflict about Khartoum is heavy handed and nobody wants to be ruled by Khartoum. And as soon as they get an opportunity to break free from that, they're gonna try to take that um, opportunity. And so one of the things that I think is, is the important takeaway from, from Clash of Civilizations is that as a theory, it seems to tell a reasonably compelling story. But when we drill down and look at the data, it doesn't seem to actually help us to explain where we see conflicts, why we see conflicts, um, and because it's not useful in terms of explaining the patterns in the data, most political scientists, most social scientists look at this and say, it's a good theory to be aware of, but it's probably not gonna be all that useful for us. Um, it hasn't been useful in the past. And a lot of the places where it seems like it's maybe an ideal case for this to work, we actually don't see it giving us any additional advantage beyond the government Khartoum is heavy handed and people try to break free from them. Um, so that I, I hope this is a useful summary of Clash of Civilizations. Um, it's something you, I'm sure you'll hear talked about at some point um, if you haven't already, um, because it's sort of out there in the larger zeitgeist around international politics.